All right, I'm going to kick off. Um, so firstly, thanks everybody for joining us for this Data Vault series that we're going to be hosting um, as part of the sort of Verigens, I suppose, summer here down in uh, Australia and I suppose winter if you're anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, in Northern Hemisphere. So my name is Peter Avenant and there's all my contact details. I am collaborating with a gentleman called Michael Buller on putting this Data Vault series together. And the first session we're going to do here is let me just go to the next slide, the six. First session we're going to do here is about converting the VentureWorks LT2012 source database into a data vault model. And we're going to be using a little bit of Bible script. So before we get stuck into the, that, over there is, I suppose, the series we're going to cover. We're only going to cover the first point today. Next week, um, I think the webinar is already up, and at the end I've got a slide on that. We're going to take the, I suppose, what we call natural metadata, that we are can, can read from the source system and put that into a metadata model. So in MIST 4.0, which is going to be um, on our website within the next sort of week or so, the release candidate of that, there's a new sort of offline schema and metadata modeling feature coming up, which we will use to then be able to enhance the natural metadata with business rules and even pull in flat files. So if you have flat files that you're putting into your data vault, that is a place where you can define the flat file metadata and use that flat file metadata to then also generate your data vault model. And then after we've gone through the sort of metadata modeling and set up the whole structure for that, and, and by the way, all of the code we're doing in this series is gonna be made available on bimblescript.com. We are then going to go into how do we uh, populate a staging environment, a historical staging environment, uh, how do we use that metadata to generate our hubs, our satellites and links. And then, you know, as we go through it, we may refine this a little bit, but basically we're going to end up at the end of this series with a fully automated, metadata-driven application that will generate from source all the way through into your cubes, if, if that's where you want to end up in. So as I said, the code in this first version will work as is in Bits Helper. So if you're coding using Bimal coding Bits Helper, you know, this code will work as is. In the next series, we are going to use some more of the MIST features, but the methodology that we'll use and the, the things that we'll do using MIST, you could probably replicate that um, using maybe master data services or some other form of storing your metadata. I suppose at that point, you'll probably have to ask yourself the question is, the, the cost of a single license of MIST worth the effort of building a metadata model outside of MIST. So I'll give you a bit of a quick product overview. At the top uh, there, we've got MIST, which is our development environment. And obviously, if you're using Bits Helper, that's where Bits Helper would come in. And then we would be able to generate some BIML and BIML script. Now, again, if you're new to BIML, um, BIML is an XML-based language. And when we go into the code, you'll see what it is. So BIML is a, a markup language. It stands for Business Intelligence Markup Language. And BIML script is where you can use a scripting language like C Sharp or VB to automate and create patterns that will actually generate vast amounts of BIML, which then obviously generates vast amounts of assets, i tables or packages or even cubes. Now on the on the left hand side there you'll see offline schema metadata model and metadata instance. Those guys over there are the new features that is in this 4.0 and we'll briefly touch on it maybe in this session, but that is what the next session is all about. And then your code is passed down to your BIML compiler, which can generate uh, out all your documentation and Linux tracking database schema, which is where we're going to probably stop today at the database schema. Right at the end, I'll sh just show you what, would, what it would look like if you use some of that sort of natural metadata to, to generate uh, all of your packages. And then all the way to the right, using this, you can go into the cubes. Verbit is another product we offer, but we'll probably touch on that um, in future ser uh, series specifically geared towards that. That's an Excel add-in, by the way. So you may be familiar, if you're using the Kimball Data Warehouse methodology, which I must say I have used all my life, and I've just recently discovered the wonders of Data Vault, but that is pretty much, without maybe adding a couple of layers of complexity, that's pretty much what you have. You have your operational schema, you'll extract your staging, you'll probably create a, a historical staging area if you want, and then from there you'll do your transform and load into a data, business data warehouse, or the Kimball Data Warehouse, which will be dimensional, and then you'll build out your cubes and your labs. So the real question now is why do we need Data Vault? And, and by the way, I'm not going to deep, dig deep into Data Vault and all the things about Data Vault. We, we are going to give you references at the end. So if you are familiar with Data Vault, you probably know all of this. If you're unfamiliar with Data Vault, um, there's much better resources that you can go and read up about Data Vault from the source. Data Vault modeling is applied. The resulting data verse will, you know, and I'm just going to read out the green things. It does improve agility. And as I said, I come from a 
Kimball background and uh, the first time I saw Data Vault, I looked at all of the tables and I went, oh, really? Do I need to create all of those tables? Well, you can only really do Data Vault if you have some form of automation and generation. And there are other tools out there that does that, but what I'll show you with Bimmel is the flexibility that you have in building your own patterns. It also lends it well to incremental builds. It's historically accurate. In other words, it's all the data all the time. Auditability and a to lower total cost of ownership. But again, as I said, I'm not gonna do a, a, a big old song and dance about Data Vault. This is one of the key things that took me a little while to get my head around, which is the layer ana ana uh, analysis. Now with Data Vault, it actually creates a far better separation of what each layer is what, uh, about. So your operational system is for your data capture. Your data warehouse is obviously where your data integration happens. And then your data master for your data, data delivery. Now the Kimball methodology kind of blend the lines between a data warehouse and a data mart a little bit, which gives you, yes, it's, it's great for, for the end user and for the reporting point of view, but it does have its drawbacks. For me, the key things that I will highlight there is those things there. Um, for the data vault, it is all the data all the time. And that's the key one for me. It's like when you build your data warehouse, you don't actually know which data elements you are going to use in futures. If you've built on any worked on any large scale data warehouse, you'll know that users will say, oh, I now need this field. Oh, I don't need this field. And, and, and they keep on changing their mind. So when you build a data vault, you have all of the data all of the time. Um, and when your data mart is, you have the right data at the right time. So the data vault is made up of three core concepts. The first one is the hub. And the hub is sort of the core business, uh, represents the core business concept there. And the only thing that you really need to know about it is it doesn't have any descriptive information and it has no foreign keys. In other words, it really is just a place where you put your business key. You're saying, well, this is the business key from the source system, or this is the business key that I, I'm gonna identify my object with or my entity with. The next thing is the link. And for me, the link is really the glue of the whole system. So Data Vault, the link actually, as the name applies, it links the whole Data Vault together. And again, it contains no descriptive information and it does not have its own business key. All it contains is foreign keys to hubs and satellites that actually brings the hubs and the satellites together. And the link is also very useful if you have multiple source systems. And if you are building in, a, in an agile environment where you're incrementally adding things to it, you could actually build your first um, data vault and then bring the second source system on and just use a link to link your first source to the second source or uh, math file. So link is an extremely important concept within a data, wall, a data modeling. Um, the next thing is the satellite. And I suppose, as it says there, this is the hardest working construct. And to be honest, this is just everything. This keeps all of your information. It also keeps sort of the timestamp. So it's the historical accurate, but saying this data looked like this at this point in time. And the satellite is also what you probably use to, if you wanted to recreate your source system. Now, Remember, um, the data vault is only historically accurate at the time that you load it. So you, it doesn't, it's not sort of an auditing system. Don't think about, oh, I'm going to create a data vault and I can recreate my source system. No, the data vault holds and is an audit record of every time you've loaded your data warehouse. Um, so, um, sometimes there's a little bit of a discussion around that. So what does this look like? So if we go back to the first slide and look at the, the Kimball um, data warehouse, how do you apply data vault across this? So, the first thing is the staging environment kind of gets uh, separated into from the extract to a staging environment and then you load your enterprise data warehouse. And the enterprise data warehouse is sometimes referred to as the raw data vault. And as you can see there between the staging pillar and the enterprise data warehouse, we're only loading data. There's no transformation that actually happens between stage and enterprise data warehouse. That's also very important to understand. So the next thing there is uh, when we then go from the enterprise data warehouse, um, how does it look like? Well, you then create your transform and load into your business data warehouse. And that's where you will convert and transform a lot of your, uh, apply a lot of your business rules and get into your business data warehouse or, you know, and so that's where some of the concepts is the raw data vault and the business data vault. And that's where those th things comes in. And again, using the metadata modeling, we will show you Going in the metadata model, we'll show you how you can actually add some of those transformations in the business data warehouse uh, layer. And again, you can then add more transformations when you go into your different data marts and push out your cubes. As we go through this presentation, we have taken a, a sample and we have uh, verbatimly applied that sample 
as we go through the series, we will deviate from that sample to apply what we believe at Virigence to be some of our best patterns, practices that we do in there. So here's another high level overview that you can look at. Now, one of the good thing about Data Vault is that the, the great thing about that is that you don't actually just need um, structured data. You can actually have some unstructured data there. You can have flat files. You can really have any source coming in and the Data Vault will take care of it. Okay, so what will we cover today? Well, the first step we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze. So we are gonna take that source system. We're gonna write some Google script that will analyze the source system. And then we're gonna do step two, and I'm not gonna really do step two. I'm just gonna show you the slide of step two, which says, listen, after you've analyzed it using the script, really what you wanna do is you wanna review that. And in the next series, again, when we do the metadata modeling, the review will come in handy because you, at the review point, after you've done your initial analysis, you can make some changes to your metadata. And the third one is, taken from the step one you then generate your model and right at the end I'm just gonna give you a very quick preview of what would it look like if you were to then string it all together and generate your exercise packages so what is gonna look like so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the AdventureWorks LT source and I've just taken a backup of that and I've restored it into a database called AWLT underscore 3 and F for third normal form and again I'll show you a little SQL script here I've applied a SQL script just to create at the table there that you see product SKU, SKU, um, which is pretty much in the middle second table from the bottom. And then the one below that's shipping address. And then it's just to simulate some of the scenarios that is in the article. So step one, analyze. So if you um, if you receive the link to the article, what you'll see here is almost cop is copied and pasted straight from that article. And I'll show you, actually, I'm gonna jump to that article very quickly here and just show you what I mean. So here is the article that we've used and we've sent you a link to that. And if you don't have to, didn't get the link to that, it is in the slide deck that we'll upload. So it's a data warehouse generation algorithm. And as I said, as we have taken this as the gospel for the first session and we are here right now. Step one, analyze the and mark the potential uh, satellite tables. And pretty much what you'll see is that over there, uh, which is every table has a foreign key. And then we said mark as peg links we've taken this and so forth and so forth. so as we go through it we refer to this almost um, and we've copied and pasted these comments straight from there what we do is when I looked at this initially uh, the first time around and uh, I suppose um, comprehension wasn't my favorite subject in school right so I had to read this a good couple of times to get get the hang of it and then I started looking and say well what is common between these things so the first thing I realized and if you read the article, actually they say mark is hub every table. So what they should have said is that every table is a hub unless it's one of these things. So when I got to hubs, I said, oh, okay, now I get it. Hubs is everything except if it's a satellite or a link. Okay, so that's, you know, I kind of had, I would have preferred to read the last sentence first, but that's just me. So the first thing I did is I started looking for common patterns. Around, and the first one I saw was, well, the first three things is no foreign keys. In other words, no foreign keys should reference this table. The next thing I said, so no foreign keys referencing. And the next thing I had a look at, I said, okay, there is obviously something again with the foreign key. So this table should have one foreign key or it should have more than one foreign key if it's a link. So again, what I said is, okay, so I need to go and see in Bermuda is there a way where I can identify if any tables are referencing this table. The next thing I need to do is I need to be able to count how many foreign keys this table has going out because that's important. And lastly, I had to go and say, well, I need to look at the primary keys. And based on the primary keys, again, I need to, there is some correlation between is the primary key the same amount of columns as the uh, foreign key or has a, is, there, is there only one primary key versus one foreign key, etc. Et so I need to have a count of how many primary key columns there is. And then based on those, there is some things that's saying, oh, well, the, the primary key can't have any other columns um, and the primary key should be wider, etc., etc. So I took those um, things first. And as I said, comprehension wasn't my strong language. So it took me a while to get my head around what I need to do. And once I've done all of that, I created a little bit of Bimmel script. And I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised at how little Bimmel code was needed to actually do all of those once I comprehended what it meant. Um, and after that, this is what the post analyze phase is going to look like. So the, if you are familiar with Data Vault, the blue in Data Vault means that it is hubs, the yellow means that it's a satellite, and red is links. Now obviously um, from hubs you'll create more links and more satellites, but basically that is based on post-analyze phase, that is what we're gonna be looking, uh, looking for. 
So let's jump into a demonstration of exactly what this looks like. So here I've got, and this is MIS 4.0 for um, people who may be new to, to Bimmel. Uh, this is the MIS 4.0 um, user interface. And here is the logical view. And I'll go through some of this in a little bit here. So just to explain to you what I have here, here I've already predefined my uh, connections. So there's my data board LT3 and F. Um, and that's my target system and um, that database at the moment is empty so the first thing we need to do is as I said we need to analyze the table so I'm going to open up a bit, bit of uh, a bit more file here and while it's opening up so and I'll zoom in for you, everybody to see here so in this file so I'll just explain to you the structure of the Bimmel project here on the right and I think I can zoom in here a little bit so you guys can see this better so we have this 1.0.0.1, uh, which is the analyze. And then the simulate data vault is going to be the generate part of it. The 2.0 is exactly the same as the 1.0. And I'll open those files in a little bit. But these are optimized BIML code. So this is where I've taken the BIML here, which is line by line created to, uh, to demonstrate the article and with all of the comments in that code. And then what I've done here is I said, well, I'll take that now and I'll apply some Bimmel best practices over the top of it and put files into reusable code nuggets into reusable code components. Right, so here we go. So if this is the, f um, by the way, so if this is the first time you're seeing Bimmel, let me just give you a very, like a two second overview of Bimmel here. So the first thing we do is we start off with this Bimmel tag, which is also referred to as the root node. And as I said, Bimmel is an XML based language, so it is human readable. You could also think about the Bimmel tag as this project tag over here. So underneath the project tag, we will have connections or databases or schemas. So if I open up something over here and I'll say, what, what can I do over here? Well, I can define connections, cubes, databases, or I can define tables. And underneath tables, well, what's logical underneath tables? A table. And within a table, we would have columns, and inside of a column, we're going to have obviously a column and we could also have uh, indexes over here. So it's a very easy way for you to construct a table by using, um, not using SQL, or but using Bimmel. Now, you would do the same thing if you were constructing um, SSI packages or anything like that, you know, so that, that it is human readable. So in other words, if you're looking at SSIS and you see something that is called a data flow in SSIS, it will be called a data flow in Bimmel. The names of the tags inside of them will directly relate to whatever you see inside of an SSIS package. Okay, so a data flow is a data flow, a SQL task is a SQL task, etc. So I'm going to close that down. Um, yep, we'll save that just because we can. So I'm going to go through the code here. So the first thing I do here is I'm going to get a connection to Adventure Work. So here I'm saying root node dot connections, in other words, root node dot connections, and I want this connection. So now it takes that connection and it puts it in a variable. The next thing I say is I say, well, source connection dot import DB. So this is one of our helper functions or constructs that says go and connect to that connection and pull down for the sales LT schema, go and pull down all of the information schema that is coming down. So now I have literally, if you go information schema dot columns dot tables dot et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of that information, all of that metadata is now inside of this variable here called import results. Now, inside of sales LT, we have, um, in some of the adventure works, we have these row grid and modify that, which is effectively auditing columns. So I'm just putting them into a, a string array here to say, listen, as, re as regards to my generation of, um, or deciding whether it's links and satellites, they should not be part of the decision-making process. And I'll just drop this down here. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop through the import result and say for every import result, for every table node, come in here and do something. And then I can actually now pump, uh, read out this data. So I'm saying table uh, name, and I'm getting putting it uh, sort of adventure work sales. So I'm hard coding this over here. And in the next series, we're going to show you how we would auto, we, where we would use metadata to create all of this. So in, in this case, we're just um, putting a hard reference there. And then I'm saying table.columns.get, which basically says out of that metadata, just get me all of the Bimmel representation of all of the columns, and then again get me all of the Bimmel representation for all the keys. So here you can see in you know about 30 or so lines of code, including some of these comments, we actually ha were able to read a database and look loop through it and get all of the columns. Okay, 
So now I have the um, the columns in my um, database, and if I were to, before I show the rest of the code, I'm just going to go and right click here and say convert to live demo script. And this is one of the, I suppose the main differences if you are developing a bits helper versus in MIST. In MIST, you get the ability to actually see what is being created in memory. So when you convert something to live demo script in MIST, it creates an in memory object. So it is not a physical object, the object just resides in memory. And Bits Helper does the same thing, but you are not able to actually see what it does. So if I go to convert live demo script here, you'll see that um, here is my tables. And now I've imported all of my tables from uh, AdventureWorks LT, uh, 3NF, Sales LT, and this kind of stuff. And again, if you are new to MIST 4.0, if this is the first time you see MIST 4.0, you'll see, oh, hold on, here is these new folder structures. But what we've added in MIST 4.0 is this logical display folder here, which gives you the ability to go and create your own logical folder structure. Okay, so it's a great way where we can go, okay, well, there's my AdventureWorks LT, and you can easily find what you're looking for. Um, personally, I think that's one of the best features in MIS 4.0, although there's many others. So now we need to go and actually generate the data vault. So we need to identify it. And as I said here, I'm going to go through this code. What you'll find here is you'll see these comments, mark as hubs. So inside of the code here, you'll see all of these comments and they directly relate to the article. And that's why the code that I'm showing you follows the flow of the article. Um, and when I open the 2.0 version of this code, you'll see that the BIML is much simplified. So the first thing I need to do is I'm, I'm just going to get a column count. And that's what I'm doing there is I'm saying, get me a count table.columns, get me a count of all the columns that isn't one of these two guys. Okay. Because um, I want to exclude them out of my, 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 my thinking processes. And they are not part of the primary key. In other words, what I'm doing there is I'm saying, listen, how many, um, I suppose, satellite columns do I have? How many columns is not part of the, the, the natural business key and isn't any of these audit columns? The next thing I do is, remember I said to you, identify the tables that are not referenced by other tables. So here I've got table.references.count. So this says, is this table referenced by anything? And again, when I coded this all up, and I'll just show you one little bit of, um, if you are new to uh, BIML, this will be uh, relevant to you. But if you are using Bits Helper, I just want to show you that without actually using MIST, it would have been very, very hard for me to actually build this code, and especially in the time frame I wanted to do. Because when I analyzed that um, the article, I said, okay, well, what I need to do, okay, well, I need to have something where I go, I know that this is something to do with the table, and I am going to have a look at the references. So all I did is I typed in ref, and I was able to see the references over here. Okay, so I could see, I, I knew that I needed something in this, either this way or that way, and I knew that, that it's references. And when I get into the columns uh, a little bit later on, I'll show you how easy it is. So the IntelliSense certainly makes it um, great. You, you can obviously go to verijones.com and go to our um, website there. All of, the all of these attributes are documented there. When you hover over anything inside of MIST, you actually get um, a description of what that is. So it's um, you don't have to go back and forth to the, to the documentation. The documentation is in the tool. Okay, so now I I know that I that first um, criteria here of uh, this table is not being referenced by anything. The next thing I needed to do, remember I said the next thing I needed to do, I need to get a count of the number of foreign key columns. So again, just a little bit of link query here. Don't worry, don't try and sort of like write this down. All of this code is being here. So I'm getting a reference count, how many foreign keys have I? And then I'm getting a count of how many foreign keys do I have that is part of the primary key. So just to give you an example of what I mean, I'm going to go to the generated code here a little bit. I'm just going to look at the customer address here. So, and I'll zoom in in a second. So the first one is get the reference count. So what I'm doing there is I'm saying, go to this table and go and look for anything that starts with table reference or has this object name of table reference so here i've counted two okay so now i know i've got two foreign keys the next thing i've done is i said okay hold on go and see how many of those columns is used is also used in my primary key in other words are they down here so i have two so now i know that i have two primary key columns and i also have two keys that are foreign keys but are part of the primary key okay so that's how the logic works there 
The next thing here is basically to say, listen, go and count how many primary keys, the columns is in the primary keys. In other words, here I would have two again. Okay, so those with those three counts there and variation of those counts, I could actually create everything that I need. So I go in here and I'm not going to go into this in detail, but basically I'll go through the first one here to say, so we've done this, no foreign keys referencing, has only one foreign key um, and the primary key is wider than, so basically what I'm saying here is that the reference count, uh, the reference count and the primary key count needs to be the same. So in other words, the amount of foreign keys that I have must be the same as the primary key. The second thing I need to say is that the primary key count must be, uh, or the reference primary key count must be less than the primary key count, and the reference count needs to equal to one. Okay, so work that out. If you are anything as good as comprehension as me, it'll take you a while to figure all of that out. So that is that one there. So here I'm, defined, I'm identifying a link. I'm identifying a satellite, which we only have one of, which is the um, shipping address. We define another link here, and then basically down the bottom here, remember I'm checking for tables that where all of the columns is a primary key column and a foreign key column. So which is the sort of else if that's the default, and then I'm adding it as an annotation. Now annotation of a type tag, um, you can actually add annotations to anything in Bimble. But what I've done here is I'm actually tagging this table now. So I've now figured out that this table is a link or this table is a satellite. I am now tagging it to say, listen, for the next process, you, in the next process, when I look at the next file that comes through this, go and do whatever the link needs to do. And then as I go through down the bottom here, this, this table here will be tagged as a hub. So when we look at the next group, you'll see you know, me referencing hubs and links. So I'll zoom out here a little bit into 100%. So as you can see there, about 85 lines of code, um, which is now live. And I'll open up very quickly for you the 2.00 file here, which is does exactly the same thing, but is optimized Bimble code here. So the top bit here is the same. But when you get down to the annotations here, you'll see I've just written a very small piece of Bimble code here that actually does exactly that, which looks at all of these foreign key tables and gets the links and satellite. Here. Let me zoom in there for you guys um, uh, add a little bit. So that is the effectively all of that annotation uh, without the comments. So, um, and this is the way I code, to be honest, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of um, uh, descriptions everywhere and things like that. And as I said, there's 33 lines of code there. And the great thing about using Bimmel is that you are now not limited by um, some black box that is auto-generating or applying rules for you. You have the ability here to go and apply your own versions or variations of um, the auto-generated code. Okay, so that in a nutshell is how do we how we have now um, just identified um, sorry, um, we've now done the analyze step so I'm going to jump back into the demonstration here so I'll go one slide back so now we have actually created this we have now just tagged put an annotation on each one of these tables to say well you are a link you're a satellite you're a hub okay so step two is review now we'll probably touch more on this next time this is a, it's almost, when you work in any data modeling, you it's almost impossible to auto-generate the data warehouse. If it was possible to auto-generate the warehouse, most of us would be out of a job, okay? So what you are gonna do is you're gonna take that auto-generated code, you're gonna review it, and you're gonna put sort of your human view on it and your business knowledge of it and say, okay, hold on, you know, this column actually should be moved out of this satellite into that satellite, et cetera, et cetera. Step two would be a review, which we're gonna do next uh, next week. And then using metadata, we are gonna be Retagging things as satellites and hubs. So step three is generate, and again, these lines here comes directly from the article. So we're going to create a hub and a satellite for each table markers hub. We can create links from the relationships um, of tables markers hub. We're going to create links from the tables marked as links, and we're going to create satellites based on the tables as satellites. And once we are done, AdventureWorks is going to look something like this. And again, if you are familiar with Data Vault, you'll realize that red is your links and uh, yellow is your satellites and blue is your hubs. Okay, so that is actually, this is actually generated from the sample that we have. Okay, let's get into the code again. Uh, so I'm going to go back into here. I'll close this file down. And in the same way, I've got the 100.5 and I've got the 200.5. And I may spend a bit of time here just to show you some of this uh, 
I suppose centralized BIML code but first let's go through this file here okay so um, again I'm gonna zoom in here and the first thing we do is we actually go and say root not the tables where the table schema name is sales LT so now that we have created this in memory version of these tables we can go and say root note dot tables where the schema name is sales LT and then for each one of those tables we are going to come in here into this loop and we are going to do something okay so the first thing we do here is we just we we are going to grab a primary key list but you'll see here that we actually say root note dot symbol table so what is a symbol table so if you've been using uh, BIML a bit you may have come across it or if you're new to BIML what the symbol table is is almost in the same case as if you were to think about your database and uh, information scheme in a database it's almost like saying uh, database dot all objects get me every single object in there and then saying where the object is a primary key so what the symbol table is it says inside of my MIST project every single uh, BIML node so any any node that's in there whether it's a table a primary key a foreign key a, you know a package a connection everything everything is inside of this symbol table so sometimes we just want to we know what we're looking for so we go okay I want all the primary keys and then I want to look at the primary keys where they are actually where the primary key belongs to this table so table dot scope name so now I have all of the primary keys specifically for this table and then I just pump, uh, put it into that list you'll see where I use this a little further down the track but that's a great little um, something to know is the symbol table I use it quite frequently now remember in um, in the table we've set we've set a, a tag called source tag source type so this when we now do is we say table dot get tag so it says go to that to this table see if it's got a tag called source type and if it has a tab or source type, bring back the value and put it into this variable so now I know what the source type is um, and because I'm going to be processing my hubs first I just create the suffix called H because all of my tables I'm going to suffix with H now again inside of different this is where remember we are verbatimly replicating what that article said so we have not applied what our what our um, naming conventions is in in the demonstration here so if you say oh I wouldn't want I wouldn't call that that way it's not that we agree with the naming convention it's just that we're saying right hold on we you can follow that article and follow the code line by line and see exactly how we did and achieve that thing so we are suffixing our hubs with an H and now I'm coming into this if statement here for my hub so every table that I've tagged as a hub I'm now in the site inside of this code and I'm just gonna go jump back and forth a little bit here just to show you what I mean by we are referencing the database uh, the article correctly you'll see here I've got one create hub table in data vault model and then I have the next one here two uh, create an ID column called hub ID as primary key I'm going to go into this article here and just show you exactly what I mean by we have verbatimly taken this. So as you can see here, here is the article and one is create a hub table in a data vault. Two is create a an ID column called hub ID as a primary key column um, in the just created hub. So everything exactly, every single line of comments are inside of this 1.0 file here. Okay. So I am and, and because it's all there I'm not going to go into the BIML in detail you know you can download this BIML um, afterwards and go into say, okay well that's how he did that and that kind of thing you also see here I've got some you know some uh, comments here that I needed to I need to extend this code a little bit saying well I need to add logic here for numeric data types and, and things like that which I haven't gotten to yet but basically what we're doing here is we're creating a table and we're putting it on AdventureWorks uh, LTDW and we put it in a DBO and we're going to put it in a logical the flow a display folder called AWLT underscore DV and then forward slash suffix and you'll see this pattern repeated throughout this file the next thing I'll do is I'm just going to create a hub ID of int64 and it's got an identity increment of one in other words it's going to be an auto increment column uh, and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and loop through the columns where they are not used in the primary key and for each one of those I'm going to create an, uh, a column in the hub okay and this is as I said this you can follow this uh, this logic uh, here throughout it um, I'm creating a unique key based on the source systems primary key and then I'm creating a primary key on the hub so I'll zoom out just a little bit here so that's my first hub 
The next thing I need to create a satellite, which again, you can look through this load here. You'll see that all of this will be line for line. So now I'm creating a satellite here, uh, the hub satellite for the hub. And the next thing I want to do is for every single, um, and this is where um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the IntelliSense of how that helped me. So here I'm saying, now for every foreign key or for every re table reference inside of that hub, I need, need to go and create a link. And then for that link, I need to create a satellite. And again, you can follow this um, through when you read all of these comments in line, you'll see the code. So this is where we would go and say table.columns, where again, it is a table reference column. And we are now casting it to a table reference column. And once you cast something to a table reference column, you immediately, you all of a sudden now have the ability to um, use more of the IntelliSense. And I'm, I'm gonna have to type this in for you again here a little bit, just to show you what I mean when I started working through and, and, and trying to figure out what I need to do. So if I go column, again, dot reference, what you'll see here is all of a sudden, I have all of these sort of reference column, um, uh, reference custom type, data type, ref and references here. And when I go to, uh, sorry, references, um, uh, or sorry, reference column here, as a, I'm not even gonna type this, I'm just gonna show it to you guys. What I needed to do is say, well, this column, what? What table is it referencing? In other words, I this is I am uh, let's say the customer ID here, and what am I referencing? Well, I'm referencing the customer table, and this is how I would get it. I said column dot reference column dot parent item, okay, and then I would cast that to a, a table node, and I would be able to use that. So again, feel free to look through this code a little bit, but as I said here, all I'm doing there is I'm now creating the link, and then for that link, I'm creating a satellite table. Okay, and, and as I said, I'm not even looking at the BIML here. You'll be able to follow the BIML and it's got inline comments here that you can follow um, follow along with. The next thing I do is I'm looking for the type of link and then for, for the link, I'm creating a link table. And again, I'm creating a link satellite table. And then last but not least, I'm looking for any source types called satellite and I'm creating the satellite tables there. So I'll zoom out here a little bit. And as you can see here, I've got 242 lines of code there um, which it's not a lot but it's still too much for me and because there's a lot of repeatable stuff in there and i'll show you some of the repeatable things when when i coded it up um it kind of went the grain against my, against my grain but i, f I followed the the script um, so this over here which is the load date the load end date so obviously in data vault you, you set load start dates and end dates for all, for everything um, in the satellites that is repeated uh, uh throughout the solution and in the next file i'll show you how how i went about uh, centralizing all of that code here so i'm just going to go in here and again convert this to a live BIML script and once i've converted this to live BIML script here it's just uh, working memory a little bit and um, and there we go so so you can see here okay so what you see here that's my source adventure XLT. so here i have my um, data warehouse I have my hubs, I have my hub satellites, I have my links, my link satellites, and I have a satellite down the bottom here. So you can very easily see how easy it is with these new logical folders to, f to get what you want and, and find what you want. Okay, and obviously we'll, we'll, we'll um, build that out. But um, that's not, that wasn't good enough for me. So what I did is I now then spent quite a bit of time um, looking at a uh, pattern and said, well, how can I take all of those reusable um, pieces of components and strip them out? So again, this script has got none of the comments in it. And also what you'll find is I have created um, some utility functions or some um, things that I can include or call. So and I'm not going to show you everything here. So you, you'll be able to follow along very quickly. I'll drop the hub down. So the first one you'll see here, I've repeated three times, which is, um, and I'll just drop this stuff down here, which is this call BIML strip get satellite. Because what I what I found was, that creating the satellite was exactly the same. And all it was, it's just, it's got a couple of different um, IDs and, 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 and similar things like that. So I created this uh, utility here called called BIML script, and I'll control click on this, which will take me to the code. And as you can see here, these nuggets are now very small pieces of reusable BIML code. That does, and I'm not gonna go into great detail of this, um, that now is um, called and inside of that, you can then call even further. So if I look at this include file here, 
you'll see here is all of that repeatable code that I said oh, it just goes against my grain to have any line of BIML repeated sometimes you have to but you try and not repeat any BIML code because it is a reusable code base now one thing that I would recommend you do is try and keep any sort of hidden BIML code in other words anything that you're going to do a call BIML script to or re include file to as small as possible and as simple as you could possibly get it because what you don't want to do is hide very complex pieces of BIML um, that isn't directly related to the name of the file so my name here is uh, include or i dash data vault dash audit column so the name of it now if I look at the name I say okay in that file I just include the audit column so the name relates to what's in the include file so if you're going to have an include file that has a, a large lo um, amount of code try and strip that down even further now if you are using mist um, one little thing here that um, was brought to my attention um, uh, a while ago and I actually put it here is this this thing called uh, designer bimble path here and I'll zoom in here a little bit so you can see what I mean and when you're working with include files if I take this out here now mist doesn't now know where I am inside of my code so if I open up a tag here you'll see the first thing it does is gives me bimble because that's the root node but by by adding a bimble path a designer bimble path here, you're saying to it hold on the code that follows directly below this started at bimble tables table column so underneath this if I now open it up you'll see I am in everything I'm in the column that has the table you know, I've got all of the things associated with that so that is um, something that um, is is nice and useful um, if you if you are working with quite a bit of uh, include files here so as I said here I've just um, centralized some uh, bimble code um, so again, if you now look at this file, we've gone from 242, and I and I could have sent, I could have stripped this down even further. I kind of stopped myself and said, well, you know, um, there there is a fine line between centralizing code, uh, reusable code, and making the code unreadable. In other words, you also want to try and keep the code as um, easy to follow and flow as you as you possibly can. But as you can see here now, with about 90 lines of code, uncommented as a lot of my code is. Um, you can now generate the same stuff and just to prove the point I'm gonna do this right now and I'm gonna convert this to a reference BIMO script so again this is another feature that was added in MIS 4.0 the ability to refresh um, live BIMO scripts and also to convert back and forth between um, uh, BIMO scripts and it's gonna say to me well I'm gonna now take 37 items out of my root node and I'm saying yep that's good I know what I'm doing um, and I'm gonna go back in here and say convert to live BIMO script and if all goes well, I should again get my tables down the bottom here um, with the exactly the same thing. And once this is referenced, um, yep, there we go. Um, my machine has probably just gone a little bit. I mean, so as you can see, they have got the same thing. So when, when I upload this data, you'll be able to say, well, okay, well, here is here is a script that I can follow line by line and actually understand what what we are trying to achieve here and what we are doing. And the next thing we are doing is we're saying. Um, and I'm just going to convert this back to reference model script because I see something that's referencing isn't 100%. So what we then do is we say, right, um, you can follow it line by line and then you can look at um, the, the next piece of code which um, actually will um, uh, demonstrate to you how you would optimize that code or give you some um, variables to optimize the code. So the last thing we're going to do here um, is I have created, okay, let's w just wait for this guy to um, refresh itself. So the next thing I've done here is I've created, so now we've created all of these files, and that's great. They're inside of MIST. Remember, they're not deployed to the database. They're inside of MIST. So I now need a way to actually um, build out my data model. So the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to show you this BIML very quickly. Um, and I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but basically I'm going through my root node. And again, I'm just looking for everything that is a hub, and I'm going to create them first because nothing, um, the hub doesn't reference anything. Then I'm going to create the link because the link references hubs. Um, and then I'm going to create my satellites because the satellites obviously. So it's easy to create it in a sequence here. And these scripts at the moment, they drop and create scripts, right? So what you want to do is if you want to put this in the into a process where you would have incremental builds and incremental loads, you would have to use either something like a red gate schema compare or SSDT uh, or whatever your, your, your current tool is that you use to, um, to the, um, reference it. So once you've built this, 
it then opens up um, in, in the SQL package here. I'm not going to run. I, I, I've run this as you've seen. Um, it creates a SQL file that basically just loads all of this data. And once it's load all of these tables, you'll finish up with a database that will have your hubs and your satellites all built for you. Okay. So I'm not going to download the code, hit build, um, and run the code there, and um, you'll 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 end up with this. Okay. So as I said, as we, we're running short on time here, so I'm just going to very quickly go into this package here to show you what's coming. So all I've done here is I've done the same thing. I've I've done the same thing here. I've imported the sales LT database, and in this case here, I'm just going straight from source to target. I'm not doing any conversion. But this is showing you um, if you had that metadata in place, how you could again easily read the root node of tables or read metadata and create a simple package or a complex package. You can make this as simple as complex you want that would read all of those source tables and create a destination package. So that would be your source to stage or your stage to raw data, um, data vault, which we are going to demonstrate in the next couple of series. So stay posted if you want to actually see how we build out these ETL code nuggets using the metadata. That was the demonstration there. Um, that was the quick preview. Some of the BIML resources before we sign off, I just want to say to you, where can you get the, um, more information about BIML? The main Twitter handle is at BIML Script, um, where we post um, everything about BIML Script that you like upcoming events like this one. So if you want to follow that, great. I'm BIML Down Under. Um, uh, there's LinkedIn groups. So we in Australia, so the OC HANA region, yeah, follow, uh, join the LinkedIn group there. Um, the top line is the main Bimmel user LinkedIn group. Documentation at verages.com. Bimmelscript.com is pretty much the community website where you will find everything from Bimmelscript.com. I've just uh, recently seen Paul Tabrak has put a heap of um, great articles up there on Bimmelscript.com. So please go there and read some of those articles. You'll find tons of information there. If you are using, if you want to, Get the free version of BIML, um, go to bitshelper.codeblex.com and you'll get it there. And all documentation is at verigence.com. Data Vault resources. So as I said, as I said if you want to find out about Data Vault and why, what should I do this way or that way, go to the source of the Data Vault stuff, um, Dan Linset and Hans Hultgren. Um, they've written two great books there. Um, the Modeling the Agile Data Warehouse will tell you how to incrementally um, build your data warehouse. The bottom one is a link to the article that we are replicating and then some upcoming events so please go to bimmelscript.com and go to there's a link at the bottom there called bimmelscript.com event um, so if you go to bimmelscript.com on it actually um, i'll go there quickly um, I'll, I'll go there quickly oh, yeah thank you i'll go there quickly just to show you um, a little bit about bimmelscript.com here um, so this is bimmelscript.com when you get in there um, you'll see um, all of these great articles over here so as i said you know um, there's a whole heap of these guys here you click on any one of these so um, some of them will actually link to external content here like paul's external content um, you can search here so if you want to search here for webinar you'll find some of our earlier webinar videos that we've uploaded and there's a great place here to find any video tutorials snippets and walkthroughs so um, anything but if you want to be, keep up to date go to the event page here and here's a link to the, the series two or the part two there's also a bimmel boot camp that is coming up in uh, melbourne so if you are in australia and you want to know more about bimmel we've got a whole day session there we've got um, a couple of other ones here for getting started with bimmel so if you are i suppose in virginia you can go to reeves's one in tim's um, and then we've started doing this uh, bimmel webinar training series um, and paul schmidt is doing that so if you want to have the official training and this is virtual training have a look at that um, see if that's something that you're interested in we'll be progressively um, adding more and more of these training materials these virtual training materials um, online there so as i said um, here is uh, the current uh, bimmel workshop and if i go to the next page i want to thank you for your attendance and there is a question here where will the sample files be located well they will be on bimmelscript.com and we will actually send out an email to all attendees. So um, on bimmelscript.com, we will get that and um, everything will be on bimmelscript.com. So if, it, if in doubt, go to bimmelscript.com. That's all I can say. Okay, so I'm going to hang on here for another probably four minutes just in case somebody is uh, 
um, decided to ask a question um, just before they logged off. So for those who are signing off, thank you for your time. And um, I hope to see you next week um, at the next session.